Hello, I'm Imran Garda. Thanks for joining us. You are in the stream. Today, could the internet actually impede democracy and maybe keep dictators in place? And how China plans to prevent rumors from spreading via online microblogs. Our digital producer, Ahmed Shehabuddin, is here as always, and uh, he'll be looking out for all your live feedback. Welcome once again, Ahmed. Thanks. I can't tell you welcome because yes. I'm more of a guest than you are, actually. <laughs> uh, Evgeny Morosov is also uh, with us. Uh, great to have him on the infamous orange couch. He's an academic and visiting scholar from Stanford University. And you've also written uh, a book that I hear is really good. I hope to get a copy, maybe you from check you. It out. Yeah, you can give me a, a signed <laughs> copy. It's called The Net Delusion. Um, we're going to be talking about why you think certain parts of the net are a delusion and uh, uh, maybe see how it relates to the stories we're covering. But uh, first of all, tell us, tell us a little bit about what you've been following in the past 24 hours or so. Well, I keep a very close eye on Russia. Mm -hmm. And today, Vladimir Putin surprisingly came out with a statement that he actually doesn't want the Russian government to control the internet and impose censorship. Mm. He said instead of censoring the internet, the government should adapt and be quick and effective and efficient in actually shaping public opinion on the internet instead of censoring it. So to me, it's a very interesting sign of where government thought about internet control is heading. Are we getting um, movement from governments across the world, uh, a greater pragmatism from them? where they perhaps realize that you can't just bludgeon this thing away, you've got to play the game and get involved. And I think some governments actually don't want to bludgeon the thing away. They realize mm -hmm. that there are benefits when it comes to intelligence gathering. And so it's not, just, it's not just fighting. It's, it's not, not just, just fighting. Yeah, they fighting see that there it, are benefits actually, to yeah, them and yeah. actually keeping it alive and trying to shape right. what people think, trying to learn what people think. There are definitely benefits. Okay, we're going to get into some of this. I mean, all of this is inextricably interlinked uh, mm. as we discuss this over the next uh, half an hour or so. So uh, looking forward to that. Now, of course, uh, in today's discussion, we're bringing in some questions from online viewers joining us in our Google Plus Hangout. Uh, I'm sure you can see me via my own webcam there. We'll get back to you guys later in the show, but it's nice to have you on uh, the program. And uh, as always, you can tell us what stories you want to cover by going to our Twitter page. And that's uh, following us via the hashtag AJStream. You can send us a tweet uh, with that hashtag and uh, we could feature your suggestion in a future episode, perhaps. Hi, I'm Natasha Fata. I'm a Canadian journalist and I'm in the stream. Now, in the past months, we've seen leaders in the Arab world toppled with many touting the events as so-called Twitter or Facebook revolutions. But has the role of social media in these cases been overblown? Some see the internet as a tool of liberation. But as governments are increasingly leveraging technology in their favor to monitor and shape public opinion, as Evgeny mentioned, how effective is it in actually helping the oppressed or those who want their voices heard. Well, Evgeny Morosov is uh, the author of Net Delusion, mm -hmm. and we introduced him. And the one of the the byline of your book is how not to liberate the world. There's another byline as well in the American edition. What's that called? The dark side. The dark side of internet freedom. The dark side of internet freedom. Why is there a dark side? Tell us. Well, there is a dark side to internet freedom as a policy objective. That's what I actually mean in the subtitle. That trying to promote internet freedom as a concept by Western governments, the American government, the British government. I think that's a little bit naive. And as a concept, it actually doesn't move us very far. So in no way am I saying that the internet itself is just dark and gloomy and depressive. I'm saying that the particular policy to embrace the internet to move things forward is somewhat misguided and naive. But you've also said that the role of social media in, for example, the Arab uprisings is over-exaggerated often. Um, it doesn't matter what we call mm. these, but uh, Ben Connors, uh, and a colleague of mine, mm. and I created some video to highlight the role of sure. social media. And I just want to play it for you and then pose a quick question. So um, let's take a look. A fruit and vegetable seller from Sidi Bouzid had set himself on fire on December 18th, and suddenly reactions on the Twitterverse were exploding. Following the hashtag Sidi Bouzid, I called up hundreds of photos and videos showing students protesting police abuses, and sporadic gunfire. As the messages went viral, 
Protests broke out across the world showing solidarity with Tunisia. Tunisia unrest makes waves in Lausanne. Demo Hashtag tomorrow outside the Tunisian Hashtag embassy in London. A flash mob is planned in Berlin on Saturday. To the beginning of a revolution was unfolding, and the mainstream media was just beginning to catch up. There are no reporters in Tunisia to tell us what's really happening. About this sooner. Mass media has totally failed. Terrorism equals lots of media coverage. Democratic revolution equals little media coverage. Tunisia. So, Evgeny, on that note, you know, you're right to point out that the governments use targeted fishing operations and so on and so forth in Syria. We've seen in Egypt as well. Sure. But don't we have to take into account that these are, you know, societies where for decades civil engagement hasn't been tolerated at all in the streets. It's been crushed. Sure. And that social media is an opportunity through using anonymity, for example, where people can engage socially mm -hmm. and express dissent and then that translated to the streets. But again, it's a strong an argument. No one is saying that we shouldn't. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I think you have to understand this philosophy of cyber realism that I'm trying to advance in the book as being a solution to three other misleading philosophers, if you will. And I'll very briefly say what those are. Uh, the major chunk of the book is dedicated to attacking what I call cyber utopianism. And that's just the tendency to view the internet as this very rosy, nice technology that only has positive effects. Right. Uh, that's of course is an over you know, exaggerated view, but I think there are many people who definitely subscribe to that ideology. The second one is what I call cyber denialism, and it's people who completely deny that the internet has an impact, mm -hmm. whether good or bad, and that it has an impact on democratic politics. And the third one is cyber dystopians, people who think that the internet is terrible, that it's causing right. all sorts of bad things, it's just helping dictators and has no impact whatsoever on the democratic movement. What I'm saying is that we have to be realistic and realize that often it does both things simultaneously. It affects right. the democratic movements, it affects the dictators, it helps both. All I've been trying to do up until you know, the Arab Spring hit was to try to correct mm -hmm. uh, the kind of coverage that the internet was getting in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. And up until then, and I think that now it's certainly still the case, the coverage mostly was dedicated to exploring the cyber utopian themes as opposed to more pragmatic cyber realist themes where journalists, academics, reporters would acknowledge right. that there are other factors we need to look at other than just celebrating the immense contribution of bloggers and activists. Okay, so we have a tweet on that note from uh, Nicholas Slayton saying, social media doesn't create protests, which I'm sure you'd agree with, and not everyone has it, but it can link people and people who know dozens more. Sure. So you would say that... But again, it's a false but, opposition. No, at least I'm not saying that it can. But, of course it so can. So just a simple question then. Do you think it's fair to say that social media played a central role in amplifying and accelerating this unprecedented pace of change sure. in the Arab world? Let me put it that way. To that answer was that a yes or no <laughs> answer, but it's okay. <laughs> to answer that question, you have to look away from social media and actually talk to people who are not guys like me, right. who are not social media experts, mm -hmm. quote unquote, who are actually knowledgeable about the region, you know, something about its politics, history, and, and also whatever. The fact that you can actually have someone on television pose such a serious question to a social media expert shows you what's wrong with the discourse. Well, we pose it to them on the ground as well, but fair so, enough. I can well, say yes, no, but okay, the, the, no, the short so answer is that it doesn't see, matter what I think. I, I hope I'm not being reductionist here. destroys my TV funded uh, yeah, I'm ho I hope I'm not, not being reductionist here, but let's try and uh, find some sort of crystal sure. clear form here. Mm -hmm. So between all the dystopians, utopians, mm -hmm. and de de denialists, would yes. a realist say, since you sort of disagreed with Ahmed, that social media amplifies what's going on. No, I if didn't so, disagree with that. Of course it amplifies. Of okay, course it does. So, so what does it do? That's the question. You need to know what's there. That's yeah. the question. To know what? what's actually okay. being amplified. Okay, so let's take one scenario, for example, Egypt. Yes. For example. Did it help or didn't it help? No, of course it helped. Did it help the protesters? It helped the protesters, it helped the government. So it is a but catalyst. The why the government so, so, it is a, so it is a catalyst for democratization. Of course, then. of course. It's a mm -hmm. catalyst for many other processes. Mm -hmm. And it may empower certain factions disproportionately mm -hmm. more than others. Uh, In some cases, depending on the existing political and social dynamics, it will favor the protesters. In others, it will favor the autocrats. Mm. There is nothing about social media itself where, where, that predetermines uh, which side is going like, to okay, win. So, for example, where would it be able to would it be able to favor the autocrats? Well, if let's say, let, okay, let's yeah. just a hypothetical example. Yeah. Let's say Libya had a more active blogosphere and they actually right. had more people online and they were right. actually doing things. Let's say NATO decided not to intervene mm -hmm. 
mm. right? And you would have people trying to organize protests, but the Libyan government, well supplied with technology from Western firms, mm. spying on everything that's being said in the Libyan case, I think that it would be a very clear indication that in that case, it probably favored the Libyan government. The decisive factor there mm. was the intervention of NATO, and it was the right. poli political factor and the geopolitical factor. It was not the new media factor. Yeah, that's but, true. I mean, okay. NATO... NATO didn't conduct airstrikes with, you know, cell phones and, yeah. and laptops. No, that's that's true. Yeah. That's a fair point. And uh, let's get another one. We have uh, our audience on Google Plus. Sia Banga, why don't you go ahead um, and ask your question to Evgeny? Hi there. Hi. Uh, essentially, my question to the author is that um, in this scenario, do you believe that the media is being technologically deterministic in terms of, you know, how they view social media? in this uh, context? Well, definitely, there is a lot of technological determinism to, to the reports we see. Mm -hmm. uh, there is clearly a set of assumptions about what the internet does. Mm -hmm. And I think so far, the dominant assumption is that it uh, almost necessarily favors the underdog, it favors the oppressed. What I'm saying is that there are certain political and social conditions under which it may actually favor the oppressor. And that's something that we need to keep in mind and to understand what those conditions are. Right. We need to actually know more about history, politics, and society and look away from social media expertise. It's interesting because, you know, 70% of Let's Focus on the Arab World is under uh, 20, I think nine mm -hmm. it is. So obviously there's a new generation using these tools in a way on, on the, you know, the, the virtual realm, but also now translating into public life. You know, in Egypt, they have the mm -hmm. tweet Nedwes, which I'm not sure you're familiar with, but it's essentially taking the format of Twitter, which is 140 characters, sure. and bringing it into a civil uh, society sure. event. Sure. One more question, if we can. Um, I think we have a question from Jillian on Google+. Plus. Jillian mm -hmm. York, go ahead. Hi, sure. Um, so I guess, uh, Evgeny, what I would ask at this point is what you think of the overall prospect of social media as a tool of societal, li societal liberalization rather than, say, a revolutionary tool? Well, when you say a tool, there is always a presupposition there that there is someone to wield it. I mean, w when you say a tool, do you mean a tool in the hands of the Western governments, the tool in the hands of activists? Mm -hmm. I, I like to know the, the context because tools are not context -free. She said the people. The people. Uh, no, I think the people can definitely use social media and the internet should be using it to uh, build more robust and resilient civil society institutions. Again, if you look at cases like Egypt, cases like Tunisia, mm -hmm. uh, the shallow, facile story we get in most media outlets, this one excluded, uh, is that uh, it all caveat, happened yeah, in the last six months, it all happened in right. the last nine right. months. Right. And in fact, if you look at what has been going on, uh, many of these processes have been going on for decades, well, for decades. Including the government's use of well, targeting including activists. the government's use, but also the activists learning from each other, right. going to workshops. I mean, it's a much more sophisticated uh, phenomenon than just a bunch of people finding each other randomly on Twitter and deciding to join forces. So, of course, they should be using it, but my point, I guess, is more about the way in which we talk about it. Uh, can I pose yeah. to you, 20 years ago, yeah. and I suppose this is something that relates to in a personal way, 20 years ago, the fall of the, the Soviet Union, if Twitter and Facebook uh -huh. and YouTube and our access to all uh, social networking was available, then do you think things would have turned out perhaps slightly differently? <laughs> well, sure. But again, I wouldn't necessarily... You, here you really have to do a lot of counterfactuals. Yeah. Then you have to ask whether Twitter was still around in the late 1970s. I mean, of course, if you just introduced it in 1989, mm. you know, it wouldn't have had an impact. To me, a more interesting question is how the Soviet Union would have changed or differed if you introduced it in the 70s, whether it would have become more resilient to what people sought. Mm. Because one of the theories behind the fall of the Soviet Union is that the government was so much in the dark that they didn't even know what was happening, and that's mm. why they lost the battle. And then you have to start asking, would the government react in smarter ways mm. if they could actually read about the discontent of their citizens expressed via social media? And that, by the way, is the argument that many people make with regards to China, mm. where some people assume that the reason why the Chinese do tolerate social media uh, is because they can actually learn about the acts of corruption mm. in the provinces. They can actually learn about a lot of the problems right. that need fixing. So you shouldn't underestimate the ways in which the government can actually learn and benefit from this open mm -hmm. channel. So for me, it's used during the 1989 protests, 
would probably favor the protesters, but you have to take a broader view and understand what would have happened before the protest and ask whether would the protest have happened at all if social media mm. was in place for a decade or well, two I'm glad before. you mentioned China because we've got to move on mm -hmm. to China. So stay where you are. Sure. And of course, you, uh, you can uh, read more about this particular story on our website, stream.aljazeera.com. Let me call it up for you. There it is. You can see Evgeny. Morozov sitting on uh, the infamous orange couch there, stream.aljazeera.com. In-depth um, analysis of uh, the shows as well as access to previous episodes there. A coloring book designed to be a tool to help parents teach their children about the 9-11 attacks has provoked outrage among American Muslims. The book includes pictures of the burning Twin Towers, and on one page shows a cowering Osama bin Laden hiding behind a woman wearing the niqab as a Navy SEAL shoots in their direction. On Twitter, Denise A.M. shared this photo right here, which is actually uh, a, a, you know, a, a page from the book uh, showing Osama bin Laden being killed. Let me go to a bigger version. As you can see right here, there's the Navy SEAL on the left. And there's some text above it, but it's difficult uh, to see it. I'm going to read it out to you right there. It says, the children or rather children, the truth, is that terrorist acts were done by freedom-hating radical Islamic Muslim extremists. These crazy people hate the American way of life because we are free and our society is free. Um, now, I also want to point out that in this text, the only word that is capitalized, I hope you can see right there repeatedly, is the word free. Now, on Monday, we will explore uh, the controversy surrounding this book uh, with the actual publisher of the book, who already sold out of the book's first printing, 10,000 copies, all of the copies are gone. And of course, Al Jazeera will be providing our own extensive coverage of the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And uh, here's correspondent Gabrielle Elizondo highlighting some of the exclusive coverage that you can expect. Have a look. Here in Clovis, California, a local high school has been deeply scarred by wars started after 9-11. Join me, Gabriel Elizondo, as I cross the United States to get a better sense of the wide-ranging impact 9-11 has had on American life 10 years later. Follow the stories on TV, on the web where I'll have exclusive content, and on Twitter at hashtag AJE911. And of course, here at the stream, we too want to hear your story. How did 9-11 impact you, and how did it change your life? Record a video and send it to us using the hashtag AJE911, as he just said. Or, as always, you could use the hashtag AJStream. My name is Sophia Qureshi. I'm in Al Jazeera, and I'm in the stream. Now, should governments have some level of control over internet content to prevent the spread of misinformation? Ironically, after the Chinese microblogging site Sina Weibo released new measures to combat online rumor mongering, new rumors are spreading that the government will soon require real name registration for all social media networks. Of course, all of this comes after the government saw millions of online complaints and criticism for its handling of a high speed train crash in July that killed at least 39 people. Many people were outraged when this video surfaced. Let me show it to you. There it is. Now, it's uh, basically showing the destruction of a train car that allegedly still had people inside it. So the train car falling off the bridge there, the, the big bulldozers were brought in, uh, people were clearing the rubble, and they started finding more bodies when it was initially claimed that it was empty, uh, making, uh, causing a lot of anger. As you can see, one of the corpses being excavated there. So a lot of anger in China over this, basically over the government's version of events and what the pictures were showing later on. Well, joining us now via Skype to discuss the government's influence over Chinese social media is Jeremy Goldcorn. He's founder and editor-in-chief of Danway, a website covering media in China. Jeremy, welcome to the stream. Great to have you. Uh, with us. Um, first of all, uh, paint the picture for us. Give us an idea as to the importance of Sina Weibo in China. Well, it only started in 2009, uh, not too long after Twitter was blocked here. But it has become the most active social network in China. And particularly in the last uh, 
few months has really uh, seen a, a, a rise in news activity and it's become the place where a lot of news breaks in China. And uh, as you mentioned, the uh, high-speed train crash in July, uh, Weibo was the place where the news broke and there was a lot of criticism of the government. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's Twitter and Facebook all in one and it's uh, uh, the key social media when it comes to news. Is there a general feeling that the government is trying to wrest control of Sina Weibo uh, by ways and, and means that include and involve and start off with things like uh, real name registration? Well, real name registration at the moment for Weibo is, is, is uh, simply a rumor. Uh, but in the last few weeks, you have seen uh, the government uh, put the squeeze on Weibo in a number of ways. Uh, firstly, the party, Communist Party Secretary of Beijing paid a visit to Weibo, which was uh, uh, you know, to discuss uh, rumors uh, and uh, what was going on on the website. Um, then there's been a concerted campaign on uh, China Central Television, which is the main state-owned nationwide broadcaster, as well as in some of the other um, uh, state media, such as uh, Xinhua News Agency, um, to talk about rumors, what they, they're calling rumors on Weibo. And uh, while there are a lot of rumors that are circulated on Weibo, the campaign seems um, designed to do two things. One is to cool off debate and to make... Uh, Internet users uh, feel that uh, you know they're being watched, uh, and on the other hand, to send a message to uh, Sina, the company that owns Weibo and other internet companies, that they should also control the content that is being circulated on their websites. Evgeny, what do you think this tells us about China and its relationship with the internet, and its relationship with its people because of this? Well, I wish I knew the real expert is there, but you know, my question to him would be. Uh, to what extent uh, this new policy of trying to eliminate rumors actually goes counter to China's previous attempts to actually counter rumors through their own paid bloggers and paid commentators, you know, the so-called 50 Cent Party. So to what extent this is a new stance in, in their policy towards rumors in general? Well, I, I think the, the main problem in China is that nobody really trusts the media. Uh, they don't trust the state-owned media. And even the more independent-minded commercial media are not considered very trustworthy. So particularly when something happens, like the train, uh, train crash in July, um, nobody believes anything that the traditional media says. Um, so it does certainly provide fertile ground for rumors. Um, in terms of the, the, the paid commenters, um, I, I don't think people are really kind of talking about them as two different strategies. Um, mm -hmm. In many ways, the, the existence of the paid commenters, which everybody accepts as fact, uh, is uh, yet another reason why uh, people are more inclined to believe uh, something that they've read uh, on a Weibo tweet uh, mm. than in an official news report or even in the, the, the comments to uh, a blog. Uh, they're more likely to believe a friend of theirs circulating a rumor. Um, but I think that the two strategies are going to continue. You know, on the one hand, the, the paid commenting is not going to go away. Uh, and on the other hand, the, the squeeze on Weibo and other social media will, will probably uh, continue. And talking about the squeeze on social media, as a final question on the TV show before we spill over into the post show. In 2009, I remember I was in China. I had access to, to Facebook, to GChat, to YouTube until Xinjiang protests and riots started. As soon as that had started, I noticed that I couldn't access these, these websites, error screens just to come out. Is that sort of thing still prevalent in China today, every time something politically fl flares up? Uh, well, um, since 2009, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter have uh, been blocked in China. Um, so, I mean, you can get access to them if you have a you know, VPN or other trick to get around the so-called Great Firewall. But those websites have been blocked, and I don't see uh, any chance of them being okay. opened up again. Okay, Jeremy, stay with us. We'll, we'll have a couple more questions in the post-show, but we have unfortunately run out of time for the TV show. So much to say, so little time. Evgeny, stay with us. Ahmed, stay with us as well. Thanks for watching us. If you've been watching on TV, we hope you catch us on Monday. If you're watching online, stream.aljazeera.com. Stay with us.
Welcome back. You're watching The Post Show. Quite a few things to get across in The Post Show. We're going to wrap up China and then go back to Evgeny and, of course, to bring in Gabriel Elizondo as well to give us a taste as to what uh, he's been experiencing across the United States. Let's bring Jeremy uh, back on uh, via Skype. You're in Melbourne, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yes, you are. So he's in Melbourne, Australia. Um, uh, so now looking at the looking at the broad picture here and we were earlier on talking with Evgeny about the, the the concept of democratization and social media and whether social media can add to uh, democratization in a nature using uh, in a nation using um, Egypt Tunisia and other countries as examples is is the game far different in China is there much more work to be done on numerous levels before we can even think of social media being a major trigger for social change? Um, well, I think that it is already uh, affecting, um, you know, public discourse for one thing. Um, you know, looking at the high-speed train wreck in July, uh, one could see uh, demands for government accountability that used to be impossible to air in China. On the other hand, the Chinese government is very, very good at controlling the Internet. And even in the case of the high-speed train crash, within a week of the crash, the, the conversation was cooled down and censored and deleted uh, from the Internet and the media. Um, so uh, while it is allowing citizens to air their grievances in a way that is unprecedented, the, the Chinese government is also very good at controlling it. Okay. Uh, Ahmed? You know, so many comments on this online. So if I can just read two. Uh, we also have our Google Plus audience interested in asking you questions, Jeremy. But let me read one comment from Liberty underscore info. Uh, he's saying a perfectly free society is a society where people won't need anonymity. Um, but meanwhile, anonymity is necessary to reach that society. So perhaps a bit of a chicken or egg uh, situation there. But we have Iron Chariot saying, um, if you give governments the legal right to censor quote-unquote misinformation, how likely is it, in your opinion, that they'll use it only for that purpose? Um, well, in the case of China, uh, there is certainly a lot of misinformation that is uh, put out by state media. Um, you know, the media uh, is seen by the Chinese government as uh, something that should guide public opinion. It's not seen as a fourth estate that should uh, reveal the wrongdoings of those in power. And then on a logistical level, we have a tweet from BCAT DC saying, he's heard that given the billion plus people in China and the similar names that they have, he hears they would need ID numbers, not names, in order to keep track or, you know, and identify people. Is that true? Uh, well, you know, the real name registration would be very, very difficult to implement here. It's been talked about for many, many years in China, uh, initially for uh, Internet games, uh, mm. but also even for mobile phones. A few years ago, a policy went into place calling for mobile phones to be registered only with real names. Interestingly, China's one country, and they're not that many, where you don't need, you, you still can get a, a pay-as-you-go mobile phone account without uh, providing any form of ID. Right. And they still haven't managed to plug that gap. When it comes to internet gaming and other websites, there's been talk of a real name system for years, and it's never been successfully implemented. Okay. Jeremy, we're going to thank you at that point. Thank you very much for your input. Uh, it's been fascinating. Good to pick your brain and good to get uh, a greater understanding of the role of social media in contemporary China. Jeremy Goldcorn joining us there via Skype. Thank you. Evgeny, you know what I find interesting is that there's um, concern and anxiety over real name registration in a place like China among users. And then, of course, you put it in a different context, and this touches uh, on what you were saying earlier, put it in a different con context in other countries. Some people give far more than their real name voluntarily. They give mm. you their political views. They give you everything about their lives. Um, it, it does highlight the point that it's horses for courses, isn't it? It's a different situation in each political and nationalistic context. 
Agreed. And of course, much also depends on the existing privacy norms. Mm. I mean, you'll probably hear mm. from a lot of countries where people actually don't have the same respect for privacy mm. as people in the West do. And it doesn't mean that privacy doesn't matter, it's just that they express it differently. Mm. So many would not probably be concerned with even stamping their real name to an opinion. Mm. To me, what's interesting is that the only country where uh, real name policy has been tried on a large scale recently is South Korea mm. and South Korea gave it up actually just a few months ago. Mm. Uh, so uh, that experience needs to be evaluated by the Chinese or whoever when they think about ways mm. to make it work. To me, what can make it work is the increasing concern about cybercrime. The real need to have people authenticate themselves on the internet comes from the pressure uh, about, you know, and concerns about cybercrime and cyber war and people's identities being stolen, and, yeah. you know, people mispersonating someone else to get hold of someone else's bank accounts. Mm. I mean, that's where I think the real pressure would come from in the West. Mm. You will hear more and more Western governments actually calling on citizens and netizens to move right. to a real name policy in part because the economic pressure is there and the banks will be the ones who put all the money on the table to mm. make sure that we have more and more real name sites. And, and just a question yeah. about culture. Yeah. Um, Google, uh, YouTube, Skype, Facebook, Twitter, all rooted in the United States, rooted mm. in the quote unquote West, in the English language. Sure. As we're seeing, uh, more countries develop their own versions of this technology yeah. and these blogging sites, social mm -hmm. media sites. Are we going to see uh, a changing uh, paradigm as we go along? Because for the moment, sure. unfortunately, sure. this is completely asymmetrical. Most people have to find a way sure. to plug themselves into an existing sure. American and well, English well, language well, look, paradigm. I mean, developing it now may mm. already be too late. Mm. I, I'll give you one very interesting example. If you look at the differences between, say, Russia, China, and Iran, or Russia and China, let's stick to those two, and countries in the Middle East, mm. you'll see that Russia and China have actually strategically cultivated their own domestic mm. social networking champions. All of the social activity happens on their own domestic social networking sites mm. and microblogging sites, mm. and they can control those sites much more effectively mm. than, or at least easier, like, than it is to control Facebook and Twitter. And if you look at the Middle East, what could the Mumbai government do with Facebook and Twitter? They wouldn't call Mark Zuckerberg, he wouldn't take their call. <laughs> you know, if a member of the Chinese Politburo calls any Chinese internet company, mm. they'll pick up their phone and right. they'll do whatever they're being told. So in that sense, there is pressure to develop those tools and services. But what I fear is that in many countries, and you know, I shouldn't really fear it because I'm not actually acting for certain <laughs> governments. Well, what I think will happen is that the certain governments, as they try to roll out these new platforms, mm. they discover that most of the populations are already on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and elsewhere. So that will be very tricky. Okay. I was, I was just gonna say, you know, we we uh, have this uh, screen grab of V Contact, I believe it's called, Contact, the Russian yeah. version of Facebook. Now, obviously, they used many people, and I believe it's Belarus use uh, V Contact, mm -hmm. right? And then. As you said, Russia does control it, and so they've been able to right. take down pages. Oh, in Belarus, you had entire groups disappearing, yeah. social groups supporting protests mm -hmm. disappearing from Kontakte. You will be, even though Facebook deletes plenty of groups as well, right. uh, it does it for different reasons. Fair I point. don't think it's because of political pressure. Right. Okay, let's move on now. As part of our coverage of the 10th anniversary of 9-11, of Al Jazeera will be telling the stories of how people across America were, atta were, were affected, rather. Uh, by the event. Now I'm here to tell us more about this is Al Jazeera correspondent Gabriel Elizondo who joins us via Skype from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Gabriel, thanks for joining us uh, in the stream. You've uh, been on what sounds like an amazing road trip. Uh, tell us about the road trip and whether there were any common threads of, of meaning and any common themes along the way. Well, we're not quite halfway uh, through it yet, but um I think what's struck me so far is how many people across America, or at least the American West that I've been through so far, were indirectly affected by 9-11. Maybe they didn't have a relative or friend that were, was killed, but yet in subsequent events down the, year, down the road, they somehow were brought into the whole 9-11 story. And, and that's what sort of struck me so far. A high school in California that uh, has had eight graduates that have been killed in wars since 9-11. Uh, a family in uh, Arizona, a Sikh family in Arizona that 
Uh, one of their family members was killed four days after 9-11 he was, because he was wearing a turban. I mean, a, a guy here in New Mexico that had a massive career change after 9-11 that was very interesting. So it's a, that sort of indirect connection to 9-11 that's sort of been striking. And uh, Gabriel, if you could just uh, tell our viewers how you plan on using this hashtag that Al Jazeera has uh, created, I believe it's AJE911, and what you hope to do with it. Yeah, I've just been I've just been tweeting along the way various things that I've seen, various people that I've talked to, little things, and and I'm also sending out messages uh, on Twitter at the hashtag AJ911, asking people questions. Like, mm -hmm. for example, um, you know, people say that 9/11 changed everything. Did it? And then I'm getting responses from people, and I'm going to put that on the blog Al Jazeera uh, website blog on 9/11 2011. So I'm just trying to use social media and, and really Twitter to reach out to people around the world, not just in middle America, right. uh, to kind of get some thoughts on some things. And they can also follow the journey and, and kind of see how things are developed and make up their own mind on what people are telling the world. Evgeny, as a cyber realist, huh. this uh, cooks up an inter interesting prospect because you have people commemorating an event in the past. It's not a real-time event that's happening now. And with that comes differing narratives regarding a past event. Do you not accept that this is, you know, educational for all of, all of us? It gives. I just people don't know wh why do you assume? Why do you always start from the negative, as if I should oppose everything that involves <laughs> the internet? We needed or you to stir the pot with that yeah. matter. <laughs> you know, I must say that the mm. school of cyber realism has no firm position on this. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, what is a the philosophical position? one? But I think common sense tells me that right. it's okay. Right. Yep. Mm. I mean, I, 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 you know, again, there are all sorts of wild experiments happening online, mm -hmm. many of them reflect the wildness of human nature, you know, so I see nothing at all. I mean, you can talk about the efficiency and the efficacy of this, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to digital activism, you know, people have often, uh, you know, bashed me for using this term slacktivism, where mm -hmm. people engage in all sorts of colorful, interesting online campaigns that essentially don't amount to nothing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to make that criticism, you have to start with some goal in mind. If the goal is commemoration, I think everything right. counts. If the goal is overthrowing the regime in Iran or China, right. then you have to be much more strategic and much more discriminatory, in part because so much is at stake politically. So, you know, I, I'm not by any means a cultural conservative when it comes to digital culture. Okay, Nimorosov. Great pleasure having you on the program. Thanks for having me. Uh, good to have your energy, your insight, and your passion as well. And a bit of skepticism. Accent. Your accent is wonderful. <laughs> you know, I'm going to work on the impersonation a little, a little bit later on. Ahmed, uh, thanks again. Gabriel Elizondo, thank you very much for giving us a taste of what we can expect regarding the special coverage. And of course, uh, just promoting all the different tools that we're using at Al Jazeera in our special coverage. Good luck with the rest of your road trip. I look forward to hearing your stories uh, uh, as they are expressed in your reports and your blogs. Thank you. They have Gabriel Elizondo, Kenny Morosov and Ahmed as always. Ahmed will be back on Monday along with Derek. So be sure to join us then. And of course, uh, if you really, really love us, you can watch a rerun of this show on stream.aljazeera.com. It will be put up in about an hour or two. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.